to the and that was so uh, hello and okay and great um so great well thanks again um and uh so as part of this talk i'm i'm certainly happy to uh, uh take people's questions and so um i'll as i as i go i'll try to keep an eye on the chat but of course if um you know if i missed your question we'll, we'll have a, a q a session at the end also and i'm i'm, I'm happy to uh, happy to take things there as well so the topic i want to talk about um is uh is part of an area that's been um gathering momentum in recent years both because it addresses fundamental questions within the field of computer science and also fundamental ways in which computer science uh, i would say is engaging with issues in the broader world uh, as we use algorithms and ai to make increasingly high stakes decisions about people and as we we do that we encounter these questions of fairness and bias and so i, I want to talk about some of the work uh, that I and others have been doing in this area, um, including uh, some joint work here with uh, my PhD student, Manish Raghavan, uh, as well as uh, three faculty collaborators in three different areas, Jens Ludwig in public policy, uh, Sentil Mulanathan in, uh, in behavioral economics, and Cass Sunstein, who's a law professor. Um, I guess I also should check, there's a comment in the chat saying one of the, uh, attendees is not able to hear so right we should make sure that can okay uh, some people said that they can hear you some people said they don't i don't know i i guess it's the, probably the local connection issue got it so i see so a number of people are saying they yeah can not, hear. not they can hear you. okay great so i'm going to that sounds great it looks like the consensus is that the audio is working, but of course, I, uh, I of course hope people will let me know if we have any uh, any audiovisual interruptions during this. So, um, great. So we've we've been exploring this collaboration again across computer science, policy, law, and economics. And one of the ways in which I think about these kinds of collaborations is to actually go back to uh, the 1990s and, and an important development that began happening in the 1990s as a theme that was had been present for a long time in the human computer interaction literature uh, became mainstream across all of computer science. And that was the idea that in a sense, we weren't just building technical systems, but we were really beginning to build through the web and through the public embrace of the internet systems that had both a technical and a social component. Right, that we could almost think of our system design as taking place in this two-dimensional set, set of axes, uh, both the social and the technical. Right, and in that sense, we uh, we were building what 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 some termed socio-technical systems. Now, the thing with socio-technical systems is that that they had some interesting design consequences. Right, if you thought of them purely technically, then you would be consistently surprised at the way they would rebound against your best efforts at design as they bumped up against uh, feedback loops in human, social, economic, and behavioral processes. On the other hand, if you viewed them as purely social platforms, then you would be surprised in a sense by the opposite effect, which is that many of these human social effects were being constrained and shaped by the technical decisions that you were making. So it really was this two-dimensional world. And we, we moved around quite actively in this two-dimensional world, building increasingly complicated social media platforms. Um, but I would argue that over the past um, five to 10 years, as time has gone on, we've discovered that as we move in this two-dimensional world, we encounter effects that we don't un un understand. We see polarization and conflict. We see misinformation. We see bias and unfairness in the decisions that uh, ar arise. We see disparate impact on different groups. In other words, we're in a time when there is a lot of, of difficulty and uncertainty in the world. That's something that we all perceive. And these difficulties are often being borne un, unequally by different groups. So what, what we began to discover is that there really was this third dimension that we were, we were feeling the effects of, even if we hadn't explicitly articulated it. And that was what you might call a normative dimension. In other words, in addition to the technical and the, the 
social, there was a question of what is the desired outcome from these systems? What is the right thing to do in just, just in designing these systems? What is our desired or intended consequence? Because what we found was that just because we had fully integrated the social with the technical, just because we understood the social feedback effects, didn't mean that we were necessarily using them for the outcomes that we wanted. And just because an entity building a platform understood the social feedback effects didn't mean they were necessarily using it for good. That is a separate question. And that is the kind of normative issue that has increasingly been occupying a central position in some of the research taking place within uh, the study of large com com computing platforms. Right? And, and we're seeing this all the more because we're encountering situations where the kinds of systems that we've been developing, machine learning systems, AI classification systems, which we typically have been using for problems in the online world are increasingly spilling over into the offline world where they're making decisions of increasing consequence for people's lives. And this is how I began working with my colleagues, Jens Ludwig, Sendel Malanath, and, and Cass Sunstein on questions at this intersection of computing system design, but also law policy and behavioral science. Um, let me give you an illustration of how some of this is happening, right? So let's start with something that we understood very well from the world of socio-technical systems, the design of recommender systems, right? So this is a screenshot from Netflix explaining how it is, for example, that based on your data and the data of millions of other users, they're able to predict that you might award this movie uh, 4.3 stars, right? That there's some probability that you're going to like this movie when you see it. And this is a canonical machine learning application at large scales. It takes your past history of tastes and interests reduces, which is very complex, which is very specific to you. It reduces it to a feature vector. Uh, it passes that feature vector through an algorithm that takes the feature vector, matches it with other users' feature vectors, and makes a prob probability estimate. What's the probability that you're gonna like this movie? People began asking, given how good we are at making these kinds of predictions, why not consider making these predictions in other domains as well? In offline domains where similar predictions are arguably taking place. So for example, let's consider the offline activity of hiring a job applicant, right? This, it feels like there's something syntactically similar going on here. The applicant takes their past work experience, which is again, a very complex object. They reduce it to a tabular feature-based form in their resume. They submit that resume to a hiring committee, which in this role, in this case, plays the role of the decision maker. That hiring committee is then making a prediction we feel it's making a prediction about something, although what is actually very hard to quantify. I'll come back to that point, right? The fact that even though many of us have engaged in hiring and even spent a lot of time on it, we would have a hard time specifying our objective function when we engage in hiring with anything like the same fidelity that the Netflix recommender system can specify its loss function when it recommends movies. A similar story could be told, for example, for college applications. You take your uh, K through 12 educational experience. You reduce it to tabular feature-based form in an application. And an admissions committee is again making some decision that is potentially sort of hard to formalize. So all of these are what you might call screening decisions. Um, and they all follow this template that I've pictured here, right? Employment as we look at job applicants, education as we look at uh, admissions decisions, Credit, when we evaluate, say, loan applications based on the success, predictions about the successful repayment of a loan, uh, even in areas like criminal justice, where um, a decision maker may evaluate a criminal defendant for their probability of some future reoffense. All of these follow this pipeline where an individual gets mapped to a set of features, passed through some decision-making entity, which could be either a human or an algorithm, uh, which then makes a prediction. Does this person have a high or low probability of being a good employee, being a good student, repaying a loan? And, Anytime we have this pipeline, um, we can ask a number of questions. And these questions become increasingly consequential as we enter what you might call this realm of high stakes decisions. I call these domains like employment, education, credit, or criminal justice, so-called high stakes, uh, because each decision matters an enormous amount to a particular person. It matters a lot to the person being evaluated, whether they get hired for the job, whether they get admitted to college, in a way that is sort of different from the case of a Netflix recommender system. In the end, it doesn't actually matter whether Netflix was correct that you would like this movie or not. Uh, it's a low stakes decision. Um, I should make a point here that, of course, you know, the question of like, what search results do you get shown? What links do you get shown in your social media feeds? What news articles do you, do you get presented with? Each of these might be individually low stakes, uh, but we take 
a billion or 10 billion of these. Uh, and collectively, they add up to something that's very high stakes, such as the formation of public opinion in a country and the resulting implications for the political process. So this is not to say that what takes place in the, in the online world cumulatively is low stakes, only that each individual decision is low stakes. Um, whereas in the offline world, each of these individual decisions might matter a great deal. And so in cases where the individual decisions matter a great deal, or in cases where the aggregate matters a great deal, uh, it's very natural to ask about the risks of bias. To what extent are decisions being made having uh, a disparate impact on individuals who ought to be treated similarly? To what extent is it having a disparate impact on groups uh, where we ought not, not to see these disparities? Um, this is a question that's increasingly been gaining attention in the area of algorithms, and I'll, I'll come back to why that is. But if we're going to understand the question of bias in algorithms, we should start by understanding a topic with a much longer history, which is the question of bias in human decision making. Um, there's a long line of work in psychology and the behavioral sciences, spilling over into areas like law and policy, to consider the ways in which humans are systematically biased uh, when they make uh, decisions. In the 1990s, this line of work uh, began to get quantitative in a quite detailed way as people worked out some of the specifics of how implicit bias might be manifesting itself in screening decisions. Let me show you how some of that worked. Um, so I'll show you an example uh, uh, actually from a, a now classic empirical study by two um, European social scientists, Christine Venevas and Agnes Vold, uh, who published a paper in Nature in 1997, where they looked at the evaluations assigned to grant proposals for European Research Commission grants. Um, as part of the grant review process, the evaluator was supposed to assign a so-called competence score to the principal investigator. In other words, in addition to evaluating the work proposed in the grant, they took the actual principal investigator and they said, how competent is this person to carry out the research? Now, what Ben Ross and Vold asked was, um, are men and women uh, who are PIs of equal professional standing uh, receiving similar competence scores? Now, to do that, you have to ask, what does it mean to have equal professional standing? And of course, that's, that's very hard to quantify. But one thing that they did was to try many different measures of research productivity by the PI up to that point. They looked at total number of papers, number of papers in high profile venues, number of citations to those papers, um, other measures of impact. Uh, and they came up with different impact scores, many, many different versions of this. And essentially, no matter how they came up with these scores, they found the following troubling fact that if I look here on the x-axis, the total impact of the PI, and on the y-axis, the average competence score assigned to PIs with that impact, they found that for any fixed level of external impact, the competence scores being assigned to women as PIs was significantly lower than to men. In other words, in order to receive similar competence scores, women had to have much more professional stature uh, than men as PIs. Now, this, this kind of finding has been replicated in many, many contexts. It's a it's a unfortunately robust finding that uh, evaluation mechanisms um, often create these disparities be bet between groups where we as a society would like to see uh, no, no disparity. That's an omnipresent feature of human decision making, that there is both um, explicit bias against groups and there's also implicit bias. Even when decision makers believe that they're free of bias, uh, when we audit the effects of their decisions in aggregate, we can see these effects. So that's something uh, that, again, I'll, we'll keep in mind as we start thinking about the role that algorithms play in these decisions. The fact that human decision making is pervaded by these forms of bias, even through even by well-intentioned people who may not be consciously aware that they're engaging in this bias. Let's compare this situation to algorithms. In contrast to the picture on the previous slide, algorithms have no direct incentive to exhibit bias. Algorithms are simply following a pipeline in which they take features and try to optimize some loss function for their predictions. Um, and obviously the algorithm doesn't know who any of these people are. They don't have any a priori semantics for what these groups are. And so there's no particular reason why the algorithm would want to engage in bias. Despite this, there are many sources of potential bias in algorithms and we can quickly sort of see where these come from. Uh, for one thing, the features that are being fed to algorithms are based on the past history of human decision-making processes. 
So suppose, for example, you were building an algorithm to try a machine learning algorithm to try estimating the score that should be assigned to a European Research Commission grant proposal, such as on the previous slide. You might train it on the data consisting of past proposals and the reviews that they were given. In the process, the algorithm might become very good at learning the confidence score uh, that's assigned to the PI. But in doing that, it would essentially be learning to reproduce the bias that humans had injected into the process through all of their, their decision making. Right? So from the algorithm's point of view, it's getting very good at matching the past data, but the past data is biased. Um, that's on the left-hand side. Similarly, on the right-hand side, um, if I were to tr try to evaluate how the algorithm was doing, uh, if it was trying to match these things, then it, it, it again might, uh, might just might, might, might display its bias. Okay, so, as we, so one thing that we might do actually is given the ways in which the algorithm is both receiving biased features, it is also sometimes being evaluated on targets that are themselves biased, such as these confidence scores in our example. Um, we might ask how we might decompose the bias in an algorithm into its constituent parts, right? The parts that come from each of these components and the parts that existed in the world independent of the algorithm. That's one thing that uh, I'd like to ask about. Um, a second uh, point, which is closely related, is the very act of auditing an algorithm for bias says something about the nature of interpreting or explaining the behavior of an algorithm. We often have a concern that algorithms are these complex, right, especially state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms, are these complex black box entities that are very, very hard to interpret. It's very hard to interpret what the model is actually doing. And so if we're going to try auditing for bias, how can we do that when the algorithm itself is so hard to penetrate? Um, so I'd also like to talk about that and some of the complex ways in which interpretability interacts with bias in de decision-making. Here too, it becomes very useful to think about how this relates to human bias and what you might call the issue of human interpretability. Um, okay, so if we're gonna think about human bias, um, it's useful to go back to categories of discrimination. And actually the ways in which categories of discrimination for human decision-making are in a sense fundamentally based on difficulties in interpreting human decisions. So I'll use the terms here from US discrimination law, but the legal systems in many countries have the distinction that I'm about to talk about between disparate treatment and disparate impact. What is this distinction? So, Disparate treatment is a kind of discrimination in which you deliberately favor people based on some protected attributes such as race, gender, national origin, uh, religion, age, or other characteristics. Distinct from that, legal systems tend to recognize the notion of disparate impact, which is to say that if regardless of intent, if a screening decision has a disproportionate adverse impact on a protected group, then the decision maker must establish that this disparate impact has some business necessity. So what's an example? Um, if, for example, you are uh, hiring people for a job that requires that people be very tall, maybe because you have to reach things that are extremely high up in this, in this job that you're hiring people for, um, then this might have a disparate impact uh, uh, based on uh, men versus women. It might be that this, this rule that you have leads you to hire more men when you look to hire extremely tall people. Um, and you might argue that's necessary for the job that you do. If on the other hand, you were hiring software engineers and you had a requirement that your software engineers must be very tall, it'd be very hard to establish a business necessity for that decision. Uh, a court might suspect that you're doing that uh, as a covert way potentially of engaging in disparate impact or an unwitting way of engaging in disparate impact. So, this is the distinction in effect between disparate treatment and disparate impact. Disparate treatment is the deliberate seeking out of um, favoring certain groups based on these protected attributes. Disparate impact is when this happens regardless of intent and without a clear business necessity. Now, one reason for these distinctions is precisely the issue of the challenge in interpreting human decisions. Namely, it can be very hard to tell if a human decision maker has engaged in disparate treatment or dis disparate impact. One reason is, is when confronted with the consequences of their decisions, they might simply lie. They might give you a sort of false reason for why they made these decisions. But the other is that they might be engaging in uh, forms of discrimination without even consciously knowing that they're doing it. 
they might genuinely not know the rationale for their decision making. So for example, um, a hiring committee that has been hiring very few women might believe that it's using criteria that are not discriminating based on gender, yet they might in fact be uh, in, in engaging in this, 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 this kind of bias. So in fact, there's a long history in the behavioral sciences um, establishing that even well-intentioned people who are trying to give you the reason for their decisions um, might not always uh, be succeeding in doing that. Let me give you an example of, of how this works, dating back to some classic experiments of Nisbet and Wilson in the 1970s. So um, there are many of these experiments that they did, and they all have the following flavor, all getting at this issue of humans being unable to explain their own decision making. What they would do is they would, ask, they would give people some decision task, and then they would ask people to explain their choices. They would then subtly change the environment, ask a different group of people to make decisions, ask them for explanations, and they would find that the explanations in the subtly changed environment um, where the decisions were in fact different often made no reference to the unique change that they had made. Namely, something had changed, people didn't pick up on it, and they began to invent other explanations that they believed to be the reasons why their decisions had changed. It helps to give a concrete example. So here's, here's one. Um, they gave a, um, they gave a sort of word recall task in which they asked people to um, memorize a sequence of words. And then they asked them to uh, name a brand of laundry detergent, for example. Okay. Now in the US in the 1970s, a very, you know, um, uh, there were various popular brands of laundry detergent. And so people would give some distribution of those. Um, in the second condition, they would again, give people a word memorization task, but this time they would ask people to memorize words like beach, ocean, moon, waves, and so forth. Then they would ask for a brand of laundry detergent. And many people said the laundry detergent Tide, which was a popular laundry detergent in the US in the 1970s, as it is now. Um, why is that? Well, that's a priming effect, well understood in psychology, in which if I give you a bunch of words that all make you think of tides, like beaches, oceans, waves, and so forth, uh, then you're more likely to come up with the word tide. Okay, so many more people in the second condition said the word tide. Okay, priming is well understood. But Nisbet Wilson did something clever beyond this. They asked people to explain why they chose the brand that they did. And people in the second condition uh, said, well, it's because this is the brand that I use at home. It's the brand I used when we were growing up. I, re I remember the packaging, all sorts of things. I saw an ad for it. Um, where, but no one said, it's because you primed me with all of these words like beach, ocean, and so forth. In other words, we had significantly shifted the set number of people who said tied. But when we asked that second group of people why they said what they said, um, people invented other reasons that had nothing to do with the priming. Okay. So there were many, many experiments of this, this, this flavor. In another one, for example, people were asked to choose articles of clothing from a rack. And it's known that if you sort of position things appropriately, you can essentially force, for example, the rightmost one onto people. Many people will choose the rightmost one. So we do that, then we rearrange the clothes, we force it on people again. Uh, but for the, why they chose the article of clothing on the right, no one mentioned the ordering. No one said it's because it was on the right. They talked about the style or the color or so forth. Many, many ex examples like this all of which established beginning in the 1970s, that human beings often give you the illusion of an interpretability, the illusion of an explanation, right? If you ask a person why they made the decision they made, they're happy to provide you with an explanation. It can sound like a very reasonable explanation, but it can be an immensely hard problem to know if this was the real reason why they did things, because even the person themselves might not know. It's clear what this means for questions like Dis discrimination. <clears throat> Even if I were to go to a hiring committee, which had a bad track record of disparate impact, and ask them, why are you making these decisions that you made? They would give you a lot of criteria that they had in mind, but we can't know, and neither can they, whether these are the real reasons. I think this is sort of an interesting sort of twist on the classic question of interpretability for algorithms, because it says that while we think of humans as some kind of gold standard for interpretability, this might have things backwards. Right. Is it possible that it's actually the humans who are uninterpretable and the algorithms that actually provide us with certain kinds of interpretability benefits? Um, what, what kinds of interpretability benefits might these be? Well, so this is at the core of the argument that uh, Jens Ludwig, Sendel Melanchthon, and Cass Sunstein and I were making when we thought about discrimination. That in certain ways, well-regulated algorithms, 
despite their complex nature, might actually make discrimination easier, not harder to detect, right? This is a separate question from whether they reduce discrimination, right? We've already established that algorithms can be biased. We're now asking the detection question because preventing discrimination involves, requires that we have the ability to detect it. Why might algorithms make that discrimination easier to detect? Well, first of all, when we think about algorithms, we should re remember, you know, all of us who work in machine learning, that the, the machine learning pipeline really involves two algorithms, a training algorithm and a classifier, right? You can think of a training algorithm, this end-to-end -end pipeline that takes features, runs a training procedure and outputs a classifier as an algorithm that takes data as input and its output produces another algorithm, the classifier. The classifier is then something that you feed instances through. And those instances uh, are where you make yes, no decisions such as hire or don't hire, uh, or show this news article, don't show this news article, right? This is an important thing to remember when we see even in the news media, for example, discussions of you know, the algorithm as something that's uh, you know, engaging in bias, engaging in decision-making, that there really are these two algorithms, the trainer and the classifier. Now, one thing we know, you know, both from the cognitive difficulty of reading code, as well as from things like the theory of undecidability is that we can't read the code of an algorithm and expect to understand it. Um, but we can do many things that you can't do with humans. You can, for example, if the thing was trained according to the standard machine learning pipeline, if it's regulated in a way that forces that pipeline to be made available to auditors, then the auditors could examine the features and the training data that went into the algorithm. It could examine the objective function. Think how hard that is to do uh, with human beings. If you, if you go to a human hiring committee and you say, what is your objective function in hiring people? They can give you qualitative criteria that they might be using, but they can't give you anything close to the level of specificity that an algorithmic objective function could provide you with. Similarly, if you were to ask, how did you arrive at these decision rules? Which instances were you looking at? And what were you paying attention to in the applications? Again, they can give you some qualitative sense that, you know, I tend to look at the, this part of the candidate CV, but not that part. But again, nothing nearly as precise as what we could do with an algorithm where we could actually look at what parts of the, what parts of the data is looking at. Um, we can do other things that you can't really do with a human being. For example, when the classifier comes out, we can probe it with synthetic instances. We can say, this candidate was not hired. If we change this one value for the candidate, um, would they now have been hired, right? If we change, for example, this particular protect, protected attribute from one value to another, would that change the classifier's decision? We can ask those counterfactual questions from, from the classifier and actually get the deterministic answer from it. Um, this again is almost impossible to do for human beings. You could present a human being with a CV on which they made a hiring decision. You could say, if this person had graduated from school X and not school Y, would you have made the same decision? Um, the, the person might make their best effort to give you an answer, but there's no way to know if that answer is correct uh, in the way there is with an algorithm. Now, all of this of course requires that we preserve data about how the algorithm was constructed. And we preserve the data of how the classifier actually works. That's the sense in which we, we require regulation. So the argument is that a well-regulated algorithm can make discrimination easier to detect. Obviously, if we have an organization that keeps the algorithm secret as it makes decisions, uh, then you simply have, you know, an actor who might have bad intent, who now also has a secret powerful tool at their disposal. That clearly does not make anything better. But an algorithm where we have disclosed the factors that went to its construction and the algorithm itself is something that we could potentially uh, benefit from in detecting discrimination. Now, you might say that seems like an enormous uh, amount of information to have to retain. Right. Why would a company retain all the information that went into building its machine learning classifier? But notice that this is a policy choice that we're making because in other domains, such as in the regulation of financial markets or stock markets, um, the importance of auditing transactions that happened, looking for evidence of fraud, looking for evidence of misbehavior is viewed as sufficiently important that massive amounts of information are required to be kept, right? Ev records of all, all transactions are being kept. Companies must retain you know, accounting records of all of their transactions, all of their books. This is something companies would very much like to not have to do. It's an enormous burden. But the policy process has required it of them because we view it as sufficiently important. We could easily debate making similar decisions for machine learning classifiers in high stakes contexts like, like employment, like lending and so forth. Um, 
where we could in principle make similar record keeping requirements. What are some of the benefits we might get if we had these record keeping requirements in place? And here I'd like to start getting into some more tech technical questions. The discussion so far has been at this high level, um, but we can start to ask questions that are slightly more technical. Suppose I stored the entire machine learning pipeline that went into a um, screening decision, such as for hiring. Let's, let's, let's stay with the hiring decision. Um, I suggest that we might be able to decompose the bias into its constituent parts. What does that actually mean? Well, here's something it might mean. So I'm gonna be making hiring decisions about individuals. Each individual gets mapped to a feature vector X. And the firm that's hiring them, again, in this abstract model has some productivity function, F of X as a function of the features. In other words, if I know the value X and if I could evaluate F of X, that would be how productive this worker is, okay? Um, now I'm concerned about disparate impact across groups. And so I'm going to imagine that there's an advantage group at A and a disadvantage group D, okay? Now, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd like to assume that if I know the feature vector for an individual X, uh, it doesn't matter what group they belong to because X, independent of their group membership, contains enough information for me to evaluate their productivity, okay? So F of X has the same value whether they belong to group A or group D. In what sense then is uh, group uh, D disadvantage. Well, certain feature vectors confer higher productivities on people, right? So this represents, for example, the quality of the uh, primary and secondary education that, that you received. So if, if you grew up in an affluent neighborhood with very high quality schools, you're gonna get better preparation for being an employee. And if you grew up in a less affluent uh, school district uh, with therefore less resource schools, then you might have a feature vector that uh, predicts less productivity. So let's say that the frequency of X in group A is this function mu of XA, and the frequency of X in group D is mu of XD, and we'll assume that feature vectors conferring higher productivity are more abundant in group A than group D. That's the sense in which, although X and F of X is independent of the group you're in, nonetheless, the advantage group has a better distribution of feature vectors conferring higher productivity. So we could look at, for example, the mean value for group uh, A, which is simply the weighted sum of F of X multiplied by the frequency of each feature vector X, minus that same weighted sum for group D, right? Mu of X D times F of X. We'll call that the structural disadvantage uh, between the groups A and D. We'll call that D of F, right? That's a disparity between the two groups, which has nothing to do with algorithms, nothing to do with our classification procedure, and simply about the inequities in how feature vectors are distributed throughout the population as a result, for example, of the preparation that people had up to the moment of the screening decision. And so these disparities exist upstream of the um, screening decision. We might want the screening decision to try making progress and correcting those, but they exist independent of the screening decision. And th this function D, right, is basically a disparity measure. Here it's being applied to F, uh, but for any function we could V, we could say D of V is simply the weighted um, average in group A minus the weighted average in group B, in, 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 in group D. Okay, so I might want to then take the machine learning pipeline and ask, how does this machine learning pipeline either magnify or shrink the disadvantage or the disparity in, in these groups? So here's some transformations that I would argue were introduced by the machine learning pipeline. Okay, so first of all, there's the choice of label, right? Presumably the true productivity function is some very complicated function that's unknowable by people and unknowable by algorithms. And so the algorithm the designer, when they build this hypothetical uh, hiring rule, is going to use a function G instead of, a function, instead of the true function F. That's the first simplification or approximation that they're introducing. Second, the full feature vector X is some enormously complicated thing that is presumably impossible to measure. So the algorithm designer is not gonna use the full feature vector X, they effectively can't. They're gonna use some reduced representation, R of X, a shorter feature vector, a transformed one. Now, of course, in order to plug R of X into the objective function, G expects some long feature vector X. So we're gonna to have to plug it into a shrunken function, into some function H. So what we're really gonna be computing is H composed with R applied to X, right? So first we apply R, then we apply H, which is applied to the representation of X. Okay, finally, um, 
we don't even really have our hands on H composed with R because we're using a finite sample of training data, right? We don't actually have the, the true values of any of these things. We have a finite sample of training data and we train a classifier. And that train function is some function T instead of H. So ultimately what we're actually figuring out, what we're actually using is T composed with R, right? The trained function T applied to our reduced representation X, um, reduced representation R on the feature vector X. And so we could ask, what is the disparate impact produced by T composed with R compared to what it was uh, in the original uh, situation before this classification by machine learning ever happened when we had D of X? Well, there's an interesting way to write this disparity of T composed with R, right? The downstream effect of our machine learning algorithm by writing it as a large telescoping sum. Okay? So one way to write D of T composed with R is simply in the following very expansive way. It's D of F plus D of G minus D of F plus D of H composed with R minus D of G plus D of T composed with R minus D of H composed with R. You can notice there's just a telescoping sum. All these terms cancel. But we now have a sum of four terms, um, which correspond to four things that have had been present in our qualitative discussion. The first is structural disadvantage, the disparity between the groups that existed before the algorithm ever arrived on the scene. The second is D of G minus D of F, namely bias from our choice of outcome. Instead of F, we're using G. The second is D of H composed with R minus D of G. This is the third one. Um, that's our bias from the choice of feature representation. We're using this reduced representation R of X instead of the full expansive feature vector X. And finally, we have the bias from our training procedure because we're using T composed with R, not H composed with R. So we notice how simply by even just writing down this basic model of how machine learning classification works, we recover the idea that the bias in a classifier can actually be decomposed into constituent parts, three of which come from objective function, features, and training, and the fourth of which actually is the structural disadvantage in the system that happened before the algorithm ever, ever arrived, right? The algorithm might magnify or shrink that, but it, it, it was already present in the system. So this shows some of the ways in which um, interpreting or trying to explain a machine learning pipeline can actually help us localize the effect of bias. Um, it says that there's an opportunity for computational mechanisms to uh, identify these mechanisms. Because in the end, within the legal system, establishing a claim of discrimination fundamentally involves an attribution question. The observed gap that we see between two groups, where has that arisen? What has contributed to it? Right? Algorithms contain explicit ingredients that make this attribution easier, but only if regulation makes, uh, makes it possible to examine. them. So in the final part of the talk, I want to sort of go more deeply into this idea of uh, interpreting uh, what's taking place within the algorithm. And I, I want to focus on a particular issue, which is this idea of reducing or simplifying the feature vector and what effect that might have on uh, the amount of um, disparity or bias that's present in, 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 in the system. Okay, so looking at these deeper connections between bias and a particular form of interpretability, namely the simplification imposed by reducing the feature vectors. Okay, so, for that, I just want to sort of recall the model that we've been working with on the previous few slides. We have applicants, and again, think of them as applicants for a job, applicants for college admissions or graduate admissions. They're described by a feature vector X. And here for simplicity, I'll think about it as a vector of Boolean variables. I have this productivity function, which is the sort of true uh, productivity that we're interested in. And my plan for admissions is to take all the applicants, sort them by their F value, and just take the top R fraction of applicants. Okay. All right, we have advantage groups and disadvantage groups. The function f is independent of groups. We had that before. And again, this mu of x comma a, mu of x comma d is the relative fraction of the population uh, with features from, uh, with features x and group gamma. Now, the particular form of disadvantage I'd like to think about here is what I'll call a likelihood ratio condition. It says that if x is a better feature vector than x prime, it confers higher productivity then it's more overrepresented in group A than group D, okay? All right, so the relative abundance of X is higher in A than the relative abundance of X prime when X is a better feature vector than X prime. Okay, let me now uh, talk about a very simple example that instantiates this model. Simple enough that we can actually work it out in our heads just from the slide, okay? 
So here it is. Let's imagine I have a function of two variables. Obviously, in any real scenario, the functions would be infinitely more complicated than this, but we want an example that we can work out by hand uh, for purposes of this talk. And so um, the true criterion is based on these two variables, x1 and x2. Um, imagine I'm doing, say, PhD admissions. x1 is whether you have strong grades or not. x2 is whether you have high quality undergraduate research or not. Okay. Um, the true criterion I'd like to use is the conjunction of these two. So if x1 equals x2 equals 1, then the value of f is 1, and otherwise it's 0. And again, disadvantage and advantage means that applicants from group A have each variable set to 1 independently with probability 2 thirds. Applicants from group D have each value set to 1 independently with probability 1 third. So I can summarize all of this in the following truth table. Right? So each row says, if you're from group D and you have each of these equal to 1, then f is equal to one, and this row represents one eighteenth of the population, one third times one third, and let's assume that each of a and d is half the population. Okay, um, and we can see that what's happening is group A, for example, um, has a much you know larger representation of people with f equal to one because of this uh, abundance of good feature values. All right, so in particular, um, at all, at all small admission rates, in this case up to 5 eighteenths, all the admitted people will have f value equal to 1 if I'm using the true function f. And a one fifth fraction of them will be from group D. So in other words, there's significant disparity. Group D is underrepresented in the admitted pool. Again, even though um, the function doesn't actually care about the group membership, but just members of group D have fewer uh, instances with x, all x is equal to 1. Okay. I want to talk about simplification, about reducing the feature representation. And so suppose that we simplify f by using only x1, not both features. Why might be, we be doing that? Well, one reason might be that collecting x2 is just too expensive, right? If I'm doing graduate admissions, it's very easy to look at grades. It's harder to read someone's papers and evaluate their research. Um, for example, I might be doing it if I had a more complicated model for reasons of interpretability or cognitive complexity, right? My model is too complicated. I'd like to simplify it by only keeping some of the features. Um, I might be doing it for reasons of out of sample generalization. I, I might be regularizing the decision rule and saying this rule is too complex to generalize. I'm going to reduce the rule by having only use a smaller set of variables. For many reasons, I might simplify. Obviously in the simple example, you know, we're throwing out one of two features. In general, you know, we would be keeping only K of N features where N is very large. Okay. So here's how simplification might look. I might only keep x1. And then I would say my new truth table has only two rows. I look at x1 or I look at, I just look at x1. It's either one or zero. The average value of someone, the average f value of someone conditional on having x1 equal to one, you can work out as five nines. And so at all small admission rates now, um, what's gonna happen is the average value of the people I get is five nines, not one. And the fraction coming from group D is now one third, not one fifth. So this is a kind of trade-off that we're familiar with um, in sort of when we think about the fairness implications of different classifiers. We have, we have gains in equity, a larger fraction of root D. We have losses in efficiency, the average value is five ninths, not one. So that's often viewed as a benefit that uh, simplifying may incur. It's, it's increased equity at the cost of efficiency. But it causes two more subtle potential difficulties that are important to sort of call to attention. The first is, uh, is the following. We might phrase it as simplification transforms disadvantage into bias. What do I mean by this? Well, with the original truth table, the truth table that had all eight rows present, where I was using the true function f, if you had asked me, um, here's x1 and x2 for an applicant, would you like to know the value of the group membership, whether they come from group A or group D? You would have said, no, I actually don't care about whether they come from group A or group D because knowing X1, X2 is all I need to make my decision. In the simplified rule on the right with just the two line truth table, if I were to ask you, I'm telling you X1, would you like to know which group they come from? Unfortunately, you would now say, yes. In fact, I would like to know which group they come from if I just cared about maximizing the F value because knowing the group is going to allow me to partially recover something about conditional information about the value of X2, right? Someone with, x1 equal to 1, who comes from group A, conditional on that has now an average f value of 2 thirds, but from group D only an average f value of 1 third. And so um, knowing group membership would actually encourage me to uh, use a new classifier, which consults the value of group membership uh, and to the detriment of group D. Uh, 
right? This, this one here on the left, this four line truth table. Okay, so in other words, dropping X2 creates an incentive to use the group membership variable because it creates uh, an increase in F, but it's a pernicious incentive because it's going to hurt group D and reduce the representation of group D. It's interesting that this, this notion that eliminating information is going to incentivize decision makers to engage in bias, where that bias incentive may not have been present before, is actually, although it emerges very simply from this model, it's very similar to the more complex mechanisms for stereotype formation in humans that we see uh, in research from psychology, which where, where we're told that actually when people are in low information environments or making decisions very quickly, they often fall back on stereotypes to fill in the information that they're missing. We often think of this as a very human thing to do, but what this model shows us is that an eight line truth table will do it as well if you set up the conditions correctly, okay? Now, so that's one problem, that simplification converts disadvantage into bias. A second problem is that simplification is never even the optimal trade-off between efficiency and equity. It's never, in a sense, the right thing to do. Let's go back to our two-line truth table again. And imagine that we did, did something different. Imagine that we took this first cell and we broke out a subcell of the first row, right? From the first row, we said, let's look at the subset where x1 is equal to x2 equal to 1 and the, the group membership is d. These people have an f value equal to 1. They're a small fraction of the population. But if my new decision rule was this three-line truth table, and I first look for people where x1 equals x2 equals 1 and the group membership is d, I'll have a new rule relative to the previous one that's better in efficiency because it takes the first row and it admits people first who have f value equal to 1 and then the rest. And it's better in equity because it's admitting people preferentially from group D, okay? We actually can recognize this kind of activity, right? I've described this activity mathematically, um, but we actually do this kind of thing in, for example, graduate admissions. We might run a special program for applicants from uh, disadvantaged educational backgrounds where we engage with them, for example, in summer research before they apply for graduate school. And the ones who do particularly uh, strongly in research, we then have more information about their applications, right? We've benefited our admissions process purely on F value because we now know people who have done good research. And we've also increased equity because we've targeted this program at members of uh, disadvantaged groups. Okay, so in other words, this function G on the right, this truth table was a, an approximator to F. I've now created a new approximator H and H is a so-called Pareto improvement on F because it simultaneously improves G both in efficiency and inequity, okay? So in other words, simplification has these two interesting features, uh, both of which are sort of, should be sources of concern. We start with the full function, right? This function that in any real application will be too complex to really have our hands on. We simplify it, and now we get to this unstable point on the landscape. In one direction, we can tip into incentivized bias, favoring new approximators that use the protected attribute in some bad way. In the other direction, we have Pareto improvement. From our simplified rule, we can simultaneously improve in both efficiency and equity, suggesting our simplified rule wasn't even uh, a reasonable trade-off between those two, those two concepts. So the main result that we were able to prove in our work is actually that what happens in this example happens in full generality. For every Boolean function f with real valued outputs that satisfies the disadvantage condition and essentially a genericity assumption that says there's no kind of numerical coincidences, uh, there's no de degeneracies in the values. And for every simplification of this function f, where basically I take the uh, truth table and I group rows of it into cells using the average value in those cells, uh, then two things must hold in this general setting. One is that there's always an F approximator that strictly improves on my simplified rule G in both efficiency and equity. That is, I have a simultaneous Pareto improvement suggesting that G was not the best trade-off between these two things. And second, if G, my simplification, does not use group membership, then adding group membership increases efficiency and reduces equity. In other words, it, create, it converts disadvantage into bias. It creates an incentive to use group membership because it increases efficiency. And it's a pernicious incentive because it reduces equity toward the protected group, okay? And this is something which holds in full, 
generality. Um, now, yes, I look at the time because I have a couple extra minutes. Let me show you one in about two, three minutes. Let me show you one technical detail at the heart of how this proof works, uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap, wrap up. But we have to take questions. Um, the technical detail works as follows. Um, we have to establish that there always is some kind of improvement possible in any simplified rule. And the reason why this is challenging is it depends crucially on the nature of the disadvantage condition, this relative abundance of vectors. And to see why this is, it helps to work through a more complicated example, which we won't be able to work out in our heads, but I'll tell you what's tricky about this example. Suppose that in place of the disadvantage condition that I showed you with this ratio condition that good feature vectors are relatively more abundant in A than D. I had a weaker form of disadvantage, simply that the mean value of F and A exceeds the mean value of F in group D. Okay, That's a different kind of disadvantage. It's a weaker one that's implied by our condition, but is not equivalent to it. Now, if I only had that disadvantage condition, then in fact, strange things can happen. And my theorem would not hold with this weaker condition. Um, and seeing why it doesn't hold actually sort of says something about what the proof has to do. So consider the following um, rule, the, f the following function f. And again, it's sort of hard to work through this one in, in your head, but you can trust me that if I project out variable x2, right, I, I collapse those rows, I get the following simplified truth table. And the simplified truth table has the following funny property. Group D has a lower average value of f. But if you tell me that x1 is equal to 1, um, then knowing someone's a member of group D actually tells me they have a higher average f value. Similarly, if you tell me that x1 is equal to 0, a member of group D also has a higher average f value. So in fact, the, this actually transforms simplification into bias in a way that favors group D, the disadvantage group. Because if you were to ask me, you know, uh, I'm gonna with. I'm not gonna tell you the value of x2. Would you like to know the value of their group membership? You'd say yes, I would. And in fact, I'm gonna do it in a way that I'm gonna favor members of group D, even though they have the lower mean value. All right. So how is it possible that group D has the lower global mean value, but for any possible materialization of the value of x1, they have a higher average value? Of f? Is that even possible? The answer is it is possible, and it's a well-known fact from statistics known as Simpson's paradox that, that this can happen. It's possible for um, a two random variables for one to have a lower, uh, lower mean than the other, but conditioning on any uh, outcome of some partial event, it actually has a higher mean, okay? And so this basically says that if I simply have a difference in means, I can set up examples where this pernicious incentive does not actually happen. The incentive actually works the other way. Yet the theorem remains true with the stronger uh, disadvantage condition. And so the heart of our theorem is that we need to establish what you might call an anti-Simpson result. Something that says that with the stronger disadvantage condition, Simpson's paradox actually can't happen. And roughly the theorem says that with our stronger likelihood ratio condition, um, and for any partition of the feature vectors for A and D into cells, where we, again, we assign averages, there always must at least exist at least one feature vector X for which the approximate average value on A strictly exceeds the approximate average value on D, right? That's what can't happen. That's what Simpson's paradox prevents from happening, but which in fact uh, holds when we have our stronger disadvantage condition. This is essentially the anti-Simpson result that we need in order to make our theorem work. And that's where some of the complexity comes from. So with that, as just sort of a, a hint of sort of where most of the work has to happen in this, in this general result, um, I want to wrap up both at the level of simplification and also the broader framing that I've been talking about. All right, so what we've seen is that, you know, when we work with complex machine learning functions, we often have a tendency to need to simplify them for reasons of interpretability, for reasons of data collection, for reasons of out of sample generalization. And when we do that, when we have disadvantage between two groups, we can create pernicious incentives, um, and we can also create situations where there are better alternatives to simplification. There are a lot of further di di directions here, both within the specific context of um, simplification, interpretability, and bias. But I think more broadly, what I ho hope to convey through this talk is that 
working with algorithms in the context of these high stakes societal decisions um, allows a kind of new level of concrete, explicit discussion about the decisions that we're making, the data that we're using in those decisions, the objective functions that we bring to bear on those decisions, and consequently the biases that can enter these processes. It gives us a new way of auditing these kinds of biases um, in ways that are essentially impossible with human decision makers who despite their best efforts to give you explanations often can't provide genuine explanations or genuine counterfactuals about their decision making. But the key point is that while ideas from computer science, AI, machine learning can provide, I think, very important insights into this, ultimately this process of arriving at some of these conclusions and some of these insights into societal decision making is a dialogue that's going to have to take place between many fields, between computing and applied mathematics and statistics, um, with fields like the behavioral sciences, economics, with law, with policy. And I think for that reason, this is going to be a very, very interesting opportunity for computing to take part in this ongoing discussion uh, as we confront these problems going forward. Thanks very much. All right, thank you very much, John. That's an excellent talk, uh, very interesting and uh, also perfect timing. Um, so let's open the floor to the audience. Any questions to John? Now people may, may need time to think about the questions. Uh, so John, uh, I have a question for you. So um, um, yeah, we, we know that uh, in human decision making, we have bias. Um, um, but for machine learning, um, let's focus on the context of, of uh, classification, All right? So um, the algorithm is designed by a human being. Uh, the training data are picked up by a human being also, or defined by a human being, together with the ground truth for training, All right? So um, is there any, uh, um, uh, so in your study, you outlined the, um, basically decomposed the um, different components for the machine buyers. Um, so overall, um, is there any um, uh, theoretical bound in terms of the uh, machine buyers that may establish the relationship with the uh, human bias? Is, yeah, thanks. is there any, any such uh, study going on? Thanks, yeah, that's a, it's a, a very interesting question. I, I think that that describes a lot of the sort of style of question that I think pe people are asking in these areas. Um, I would say in general, um, it's certainly possible that, um, you know, a general algorithm could in principle um, either increase or decrease the amount of mm -hmm. bias that existed up upstream of the decision, depending on, on what it's doing. Um, I think a lot of work has gone into, in, into questions like, how does the choice of features that I'm using and how's the amount of bias in them uh, affect the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the amount that comes out at the end? And it, it can lead to some counterintuitive effects. For example, there may be variables that in the hands of a human decision maker are going to increase the bias because humans have this you know, tendency to engage even despite their best efforts in implicit bias against certain groups. The algorithm may actually use it for opposite purposes, right? It's entirely possible that if there is bias in the system, um, the algorithm might be able to use a particular uh, variable to actually detect the bias is taking place and to begin correcting it. Whereas if you withheld that algorithm, that, that, that variable from the algorithm, it might not be able to use it in the same way. So I think one thing that we're learning is this collections of feature vectors that help algorithms reduce bias might actually be different from the collections of feature vectors that, um, that uh, help humans reduce bias. And, Lining those up is is definitely one direction that uh, some of this work is going. Okay, all right, thanks. Any questions from the audience? Let's see, I see one in the Q and A. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a question. Um, could, could you say something about yeah. uh, debiasing algorithms? Um, how much has still to be done, and in what direction, especially? Yes, yeah, so that's. Uh, Thanks for that question. That certainly um, is, uh, you know, I think is one of the, the main issues that um, is, is uh, that people think about, you know, and again, I think 
some of the considerations here is, um, you know, first to sort of think about one thing that you might ask is that the algorithm do no harm, right? So if there is structural disadvantage in the world, it should not magnify that disadvantage. Um, um, a second thing, a second goal you might have, which is distinct would be an equity goal. You, you might say, we would like the algorithm to actually reduce the, the disadvantage that's uh, present in the world. So take the structural disadvantage that exists upstream of the algorithm and the disparity that comes out actually is uh, reduced relative to, to that. These two are connected, but of course you, you, you might do different things in these, in these cases. Um, I think there is in fact um, a lot of work to be done here. Um, one is actually, I, I think just a language to um, express uh, societal preferences over possible outcomes. And that's certainly, that's some work that I'm um, currently exploring with uh, my co-authors on these papers, along with um, uh, Ashesh Rambachan, who's a, a, a student of economics at, at Harvard, looking at the question of regulation of algorithms, right? So how might we express algorithms in a language so that they could interact with a re regulation process and so that regulations might actually create an incentive to produce algorithms that, that generate less bias. So I, th I think that's certainly one broad, broad category, the way in which um, incentives to produce algorithms, the regulatory process uh, might, actually, um, might actually help with this. Um, the other, uh, another direction I think is how um, the sort of optimizations that we do. So for example, the process of regularization, and this, this is something which I uh, suggested at the, at the end of the talk, how does regularization interact with bias, right? So if simplification, as in my talk, might lead to incentives to engage in bias, and if the process of regularizing an algorithm inherently pushes it toward a simplified form, is there a potential interaction of standard methods for regularization for out of sample generalization and bias? And I think that also is not well understood and is also a, a very interesting open question. Right, um, I saw uh, someone had a question. Um, uh, yeah, another question in the Q&A. So, um, any comments about how debiasing might be possible in an online or active learning setting? Yeah, also right. a, a very interesting question. Yeah, not something that I um, talked about in the talk, although I would say it, 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 it comes up um, indirectly when we think about the effect of the training procedure um, on the, the level of bias in the algorithm. So one, um, one, 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 one line of work, for example, um, uh, that my student, Manish Raghavan has contributed to is the way in which online learning um, in interacts with bias. So one challenge, for example, is if I'm using a bandit type algorithm to do online learning and I'm doing some amount of exploration and then some amount of exploitation through a classifier, um, we need to be careful in the exploration phase that um, particular groups aren't adversely impacted by having more of the exploration done um, on training examples from that group so that they bear an unequal amount of the cost of, of the exploration. And so I think there's a very interesting set of questions, which again are still being explored in, in, in ongoing work um, about how the level of exploration um, interacts and is spread across different groups so that cost can born, be, be, be born equally, for example. Um, and I think in general, how debiasing sort of operates through the pipeline through which the online learning algorithm is constructed or through which the training data is selected. This is a very interesting set of questions. Um, right, another interesting question uh, from, the, uh, from the online Q&A is, what if the distinction between um, groups A and D, advantage and disadvantage is not clearly delineated? Um, so there, there are a lot of interesting questions there, right? So, one obvious sort of modeling simplification that was going on here is, uh, as we said, imagine there is two groups, just A and D. Um, but in reality, of course, it's, um, there's gonna be a certain multi-dimensionality to these groups, right? So there's gonna be different attributes. People have conjunctions of these attributes. And an interesting line of work in, in, in the line of research on fairness and machine learning has been to consider 
how fairness guarantees might operate once we're looking at Boolean combinations of groups, right? So the conjunction of one protected group with another protected group. Um, we get into these interesting challenges. Uh, and so there's nice uh, re reason we're looking at the combinatorial explosion that you end up with, right? Because if I look at Boolean combinations of groups, I'm gonna have a lot of cells, each with different combinations. We have very small amounts of data in each cell. And so it becomes hard even to detect sort of that disparities are taking place because of the level of noise in the system. And so the question of which disparities I can detect, how many sort of disparities I can simultaneously account for um, is, is also a, a very interesting re research question when I have multiple groups. Um, and then in the chat, we have a question, um, what are the bias specific evaluation measures to evaluate the bias of a model? Um, in addition to those used in theories like generalization, statistical tests, and so forth. Yes, yeah, so there's a, there are a lot of um, measures that can, can, can be used in evaluating the bias of algorithms. And actually one, one area of research in itself is to understand how these definitions relate to each other, these different definitions of bias, right? So in one sense, the field distinguishes between um, uh, measures of individual fairness and measures of group fairness. Much of what I've been talking about here is group fairness, where we say, is the aggregate effect on one group um, similar to or different from the aggregate effect on, on another group? And there we might be averaging the effect across the group. At the group fairness level, even there, there are multiple measures that we could use. So for example, we could look at the false positive rate within each group. We could look at the false negative rate within each group. Um, we could look at whether the predictions satisfy certain kinds of calibration conditions separately within each group. Um, or we could simply look at the, you know, the average value being imparted to each group as in, as in some of what I was talking about here. That's all at the group level. At the individual level, um, uh, a very influential line of work uh, beginning with uh, this paper of Cynthia Dwork et al. in uh, 2012 called Fairness Through Awareness that many of you might, 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 might be familiar with frames the idea of fair classification as an individual level property and says, imagine that individuals reside in a metric space and there's a notion of similarity between individuals, then we might start by axiomatizing fairness as saying that individuals who are very close in the space should receive similar outcomes under the prediction algorithm. Notice how this harks all the way back to the plot that I showed very early in the talk about um, different levels of the so-called competence score in grant proposal evaluations for um, men and women uh, as PIs. And the first thing the researchers had to do, recall, was to say, what does it mean for two researchers to have similar professional stature? And so they looked at their publications in high profile venues, they looked at citations of those publications, they looked at success on past grant proposals. Essentially, they were manually constructing a metric space on researchers and saying if two researchers are very close in that metric space, they should have gotten similar competence scores. And in effect, it's this notion of similarity in the metric leading to similarity in the predictions that the fairness through awareness framework was trying to formulate at the individual level. So as a follow-up question, um, in the evaluation, typically we don't have the ground truth for the buyers. Right. Right. So how are we going to go with that? Right. So that's, that's of course the, the challenge, especially in these individual level measures where you, where you say, if we had, you know, if we had this metric, then we could detect that uh, there, there was a violation of this metric property. But if we don't have the metric, um, and, I, and I think this of course is why group level measures um, are, are often used, um, that it, it often comes down to questions about the criteria that are, are present, right? So effectively, if, if I think about how, how bias is often audited in, in the sort of pre-algorithmic world. Um, we look mm -hmm. at, say, a company that hires many people. We say there's a difference in the hiring rate between these two groups. That becomes uh, an instance of disparate impact. That's a clue that there might be discrimination taking place. Now, when we see disparate impact, right. it shifts the burden onto the employer to justify the business practice that's leading to that. And so we say, what are the criteria that you're using to make the decision? Um, is that criterion necessary? If we had used a different criterion that's equally relevant to job performance, would we have seen that same disparate impact? This is of course where things became extremely challenging because extracting those kind of criteria from people, this is not something that 
that the human brain is designed to easily do, right? We, we don't easily write down the exact criteria that we were using for our decision making. Right. right. We, we, we can't, we're bad at it. And so it's exactly this point where the use of algorithms might actually help with some of these, um, some of these things. But ultimately, of course, even with the algorithm, it allows us to more easily audit these cases of disparate impact, but it's completely correct that it still faces the challenge that we, all, we generally don't know the actual ground truth being evaluated. All right, thank you. Um, any further questions from the audience? All right, uh, we have one more. Oh uh, yeah. What about the random effects across variables that lead to this very effect? Right, so yeah, so it's interesting of course to ask how, how noise interacts with the, um, with the system. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a, a general question, which I think is uh, not really yet fully explored in the literature on bias, or frankly, in, in a lot of other contexts where, where we're applying machine learning. Namely, in, in a lot of cases, I, I think the random effects that we see are, you know, we often think of it as sort of irreducible noise in the system, but often that comes from unmeasured variables, right? So I, I'm doing a machine learning classification problem and I work with a domain expert and I say, well, what are the relevant features? And the you know, if it's a social science classification problem and we're trying to evaluate predict job performance or we're trying to predict credit worthiness, we write down a sequence of variables. You know, we write down X1, X2, and we get up to you know, X sub 20 or X sub 40. We say, these are the 40 variables I use. I'm gonna train a classifier. And then we discover there's irreducible noise because even conditional and knowing all those variables, I only know the objective, you know, I, I only know the value of the label up to some error. Um, but often that's because there's variable X41, X42, all the way up to X sub 100, which I never measured, which remain hidden to me. Conditional on knowing those, I could greatly reduce the amount of noise, um, but I often never measure them. And so, you know, and there are combinations of reasons for that. One is just expense. At some point we have to stop the process and start running the classifier. But often it's actually a sort of fumbled handoff between the designer of the machine learning algorithm and the domain expert. The domain expert had more information in their head that the designer of the algorithm may have failed to elicit from them in the design process. And so I think one very interesting question is actually, which I, I think is truly un underexplored, is this e elicitation process. How do we work with domain experts to get some of these unmeasured variables? Because much of, again, much of what we think of as random variation or irreducible noise may actually be unmeasured variables that through deeper engagement with domain experts, we might actually be able to pin down. And so I think that's, that's also a very interesting direction. All right, thanks so much. Um, any further quick questions before we close up? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's about time to close up. Um, any further quick questions from the audience? All right, um, so it's, uh, we are already running time late. Um, thank you so much, John, again. Uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, it's very interesting and uh, generated a lot of enthusiasm from the audience. All right. Well, thanks very okay. much. I appreciate being able to take part in this and uh, thanks for the, uh, thanks, 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 thanks for the interesting questions also. All right, let's give the speakers a big uh, virtual applause. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, thank you very much. Thanks again. John. All right, thanks. Thanks. <laughs>